Uh, I'm Charlotte Mickey, formerly from uh, Ewan. I'm an international sales agent, and I'm moderating this panel. And I think the way it works is I'm going to introduce you very briefly to everybody on the panel. I'm not going to give you bios because you know these people. And then Dave Forget from Telefilm is going to jump in and uh, give you the results of a recent Canadian consumer study mm -hmm. of Canadian viewers. So right beside me is Dave Forget, who's the Director of Business Affairs and Certification for Telefilm Canada. Uh, Jennifer jo Jonas, the president of New Real Films. Uh, Mark Sloan, senior vice president of acquisitions at Entertainment One. And uh, Paul Pope, senior producer, Pope Productions. Dave. Uh, good morning, everyone. Is there a, like a secret password for going to the next slide or a clicker or something I should have? Uh, there we go. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a guy. I like to have the remote in my hand. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Last summer, um, we, uh, we took an initiative to do a little bit of, um, of uh, a survey of Canadians on sort of movie-going <coughs> habits, or movie-going habits writ large, uh, not specifically necessarily for Canadian films, but just for films in general. And the, the notion was, uh, might be a good thing for telefilm to do, and it could be good information to then uh, make available uh, for all of our clients, so we put it on our website. And quite frankly, we weren't expecting this to end up with a panel at prime time and discussion. I guess the notion was get the information, share it. Uh, hopefully that would factor into business decisions that you make on an ongoing basis. So this is actually, it's very, uh, it's sort of a nice result. And, and it sort of validates for us that this is something that we should continue to do on an ongoing basis. So what I have for you this morning is uh, some of the information that's already been up on our site for a while, but also some new studies. And of course, the other thing that these types of studies allow you to do is kind of benchmark. And so you, not necessarily that there's anything that's resulted from the, the, uh, the, the uh, surveys of Canadian audiences that's necessarily counterintuitive, but it allows you to take a portrait in time and then a year later to see where the trends are going. So that's what, um, uh, Charlotte gave me 10 minutes, which in my mind is usually about a half an hour, but I'll try to do this in 10 minutes. And <laughs> Kettle knows me well. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I'll just uh, go through this. So the first one is, this actually is with regard to Canadian perceptions of our film industry. And I'll get into some stuff that's more uh, just uh, uh, films writ large. But on this one, uh, it's word clouds. And obviously, the more prominent the word is, the more often it came up in focus groups and so on. And I won't spend too much time on this one other than to say, uh, the, uh, in, in both cases, the word budget uh, is very prominent. And it was interesting that uh, when asked about Canadian films, that's a subject, or that's, that's a, uh, a word that comes up a lot. And when, uh, I'm not the expert, when the, uh, the fellow from uh, ACC presented us the results, I remember very clearly him saying, uh, audiences mention budget because we talk about it all the time. And we talk about it in the context of, look what we can do with, with such limited resources. But what audiences are hearing are, they're small. And so uh, just a, a little, not to be too controversial, but just a little comment in passing from his perspective as a researcher, said stop talking about budgets, because you'll see in a second, budget is scope of project is not a driver for folks when they're choosing a film to see. Uh, they think about story, cast, that sort of thing. They're not thinking budget, so maybe as an industry, one of the things we could do is, is perhaps stop talking about budgets so much. <laughs> not here, I mean, but you know, out there. Uh, Canadian perceptions of the film industry. This, there's good news in that, uh, generally speaking, two things that have emerged. The first one's pretty clear, and I think it speaks to a little of what Kettle mentioned this morning, the importance of international, the importance of uh, uh, everything from Oscar nominations to presence at festivals to success of our films commercially, internationally. Uh, I think that for Canadians, it has, uh, I won't say galvanized, but they become more aware of the importance of promoting Canadian films and that success internationally uh, uh, is important. So uh, that's a number that's from 2012 to 13 increased. And the second one, this is if you follow the logic, is the question that we asked is, uh, are American films better made? And uh, so less Canadians think American films are better made. I guess we're not ready to say Canadian films are better than Americans, but at least we're saying theirs aren't better than ours anymore. So I think there's, there's a sense here where there's an improvement in terms of uh, on the quality issue, and this is what we've seen regularly with these type of things, it's not really a quality issue. There's a perception that the quality of films, generally speaking, is quite high. Behavior of Canadians. So, so first of all, uh, 
And this is maybe the most basic uh, uh, data you can have. How often are people seeing movies? And I'll get in a second where they're seeing them and what the evolution is on those platforms. But generally speaking, uh, these are the numbers you're seeing for the number of uh, films viewed annually. And that, not surprisingly, this is one of those non-counterintuitive moments, the younger you are, the more likely you are to see more films. There's all kinds of reasons, I guess, uh, uh, for that. But the reality is, the most motivated group of film goers, uh, those who frequent most often, and you'll see in a second that we're not just talking cinemas, they're, they're most frequent on all platforms, are the youngest group. So what, 15 to 17 uh, go over 100 times a year, and then it, it declines from there. Uh, good news is, viewing is increasing, uh, both in 2012-13, uh, film viewing is going up. And so the question that was put to the Canadians, by the way, it was a sample group of about 2,000, so it has a fairly high uh, level of integrity uh, as in terms of being representative. The question that was asked is, uh, what are the reasons why, if you're seeing more films, why are you? And what's interesting here, too, is that it really has to do with, I'd say, the argument of convenience. And we've, we've heard uh, f uh, often, uh, anytime, anywhere, the expectations that, uh, that Canadians have that their films be available, like other content, in, on all platforms uh, when, when they want it. And what we see from these three uh, little uh, groovy circles is uh, that it's more time uh, is leading to more film viewing, uh, more interest, and better ac accessibility and selection. What, the, what that translates for me in terms of a takeaway is that the fact that films are available on more platforms, the film is available when you're available to see it. And so we're having to do less scheduling around uh, either a trip to a cinema, not to say that that's not a good thing, but generally speaking, as more films become available on more platforms, uh, Canadians are taking the opportunity to see more films. And one of the things that this doesn't say is, uh, notwithstanding that Canadians believe that, generally speaking, the quality of films is improving, it's not because films are improving that they're saying we're going more often. They're going more often, they already think they're good, they're having more time to see them, and the films are more available. So when we talk about accessibility and availability, this all sort of connects together, uh, as you can see, in terms of the behavior of Canadians. The popularity of digital, this is no news to anyone, I, I would imagine. Uh, what we're seeing is online the, uh, the appetite for uh, viewing feature films, I would think probably just like any other content, is increasing. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we're seeing a, a, a somewhat of a decline in cinemas, but we're seeing more uh, viewing online. And we're seeing that uh, broadcast TV or viewing on television is fairly stable. Uh, by the way, just uh, uh, that is also the largest audience for, uh, I think uh, Patrick might have made the, the, that uh, comment earlier, that is the largest audience for where Canadian films get seen. The other question that we asked is, uh, it, once you've made the decision to see a film, what factors into your thinking? And I think this is probably you know, useful information for producers and distributors to have. Uh, what sorts of things uh, factor into your thinking when you're choosing the film that you, that you want to see? And not surprisingly, genre, story, and cast are, are one, two, three, and, and that's, even this little table is not representative. One, two, three are far and away the drivers in terms of decision making. Uh, and uh, apologies to the producers in the room, that's not a driver for what, uh, would, it's not to say that producer, director, uh, aren't important components in the making of the film, obviously, but that's not what people are well, thinking about. You made the top ten. You made the top ten. That's right. Well, that's right. Wrong. So, it's like my province, they right. go in the top ten. That's right. So, but you know, one of the other things to keep in mind too is is also they they may have made the top ten, but they're not big drivers. Is the origin of the film. So it's neither uh, it's neither a handicap nor necessarily something that's going to energize folks. I think there's a sense of pride when people discover that a film is Canadian, but the fact that a film is Canadian is neither driving them to see it or, dis or dissuading them from seeing it. It's not one of the things. It, not surprisingly, we, we all, you know, what kind of film is it? Uh, what's the film about and who's in it? These are the types of questions people ask themselves, and I think that's kind of, in, to me, intuitive. Um, there's just a couple more of these, and then we can get into the fun stuff, but just to give you the rest of the overview, we also asked the question, uh, you know, okay, you're watching films and what's driving your decision to make a choice, where are you seeing the films? And <coughs> once again here, 76% uh, of the time it's television, DVD, uh, VOD, those types of platforms. 18% of the time it's in a movie cinema. Um, but what th for me, the in most interesting stat here is that 6% of the time feature films are being viewed neither in the home or in a movie theater. 
And so where, uh, any of you, well, I mean, you all traveled to be here, there was probably somebody sitting next to you on the plane or on the train with a mobile device, and they were probably watching content on it and may have been even a feature film. That's what we're seeing. And that number, I would, we don't have a study from five years ago, but I'll bet you that 6% was probably zero five to six years ago. And then the question for us is, uh, as an industry, uh, where is that 6% gonna be? The reality is that number is going up all the time as more mobile uh, uh, platforms become available to see films. So that's where people are watching it. And just this is reinforcing kind of what I just said. When you look at the difference, even just in one year between 2012 and 13, mobile devices, uh, this, the question here was, uh, you've used this I think one time in the last week. Anyway, 9% uh, of the time, uh, for 2013, what we're seeing is uh, not some of the, I'm sure the distributors in the room are aware of this, um, DVD is in decline, we're seeing that go from 25 to 19. The counterpart to that is VOD and mobile are increasing. Uh, so we're seeing more use, to, more use of mobile. So last section is um, when we did the research, we, uh, you know, it's always good to make categories and, and uh, four segments, let's call it, of of consumers or Canadian audiences were created. And keep in mind, this is not specific for Canadian films. This is just for movie-going habits. And uh, it's, it's it, you know, putting things in categories is a good way to get your head around behaviors that are out there. And where we end up is with four groups, and I'll, I'll just quickly go through the four, and then uh, Charlotte can, uh, can or I'll kind of take over, I guess. Uh, Casual consumers are the biggest part of the audience uh, in terms of numbers. It's about half of the viewing audience. And that uh, I'm sorry to say that it's also the group that is the least inclined to see feature films. And, and there's two stats here that, that, that spring out. One is the number of films on an annual basis that this group is seeing, which is uh, 25 is, is a relatively low number. And you also get a bit of a breakdown here as to where they're seeing them uh, in terms of in-home cinema or mobile. This, I would say, is the least motivated uh, group. It's, I'm sorry to say it's almost half the group, but th that's the reality is that there is a segment of the population who are just not, not uh, engaged in seeing films on a regular basis. Uh, they're seeing television series, they're doing other things. They tend to be older, uh, the more stay at home, uh, but that's, that's one segment. By the way, it gets better. This is the, <laughs> the group that's the least, uh, least engaged. The active in home, uh, we're seeing that they're, uh, they're watching on television, they, they watch a lot of broadcast. Uh, for, th for this group, the notion of being innovated is, is, is using a PVR. So uh, this is also slightly older. Uh, I'm not describing myself here, but not far. Uh, they see more films, but they're seeing them at home and they also watch a lot of dramatic TV. Uh, uh, the third group is uh, uh, relatively younger and they say this is sort of the 20 to 35, generally speaking. They're going to the cinema, uh, they're, they're seeing uh, more films, and if you see the number, like where we talked about in-home film viewing by platform, you can see that their online is the biggest number for this group. So they're that's where we get the, the notion of connected. They're connected to things, they're looking for, for content online, and they're very motivated, and this is where we've probably seen the increase that's corresponding to more mobile accessibility, let's call it, and they're seizing the opportunity to see more films and they're seeing them online. And this is, not surprisingly, my favorite group. These are the most motivated, engaged viewers. They are the leaders on just about every platform. They also tend to be the youngest group. This is uh, the 11% of the population that is seeing the most films. They're seeing 171 films a year. They see the most of everything, whether it's TV, uh, dramatic series, or short films. Uh, they're engaged, uh, they go to the cinema, they're watching films at home, they're seeing films online, and as new platforms come on stream, they are the early adopters, and they're making use of the opportunities for seeing content to profit from it, and they, uh, they uh, there was a, uh, I think cord stacking is the, 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 the jargon I heard last week. I would say these, th these folks are platform stacking, if that's possibly a word. Uh, when new platforms come on, they don't abandon, they don't stop going to movie cinemas, they just watch more films and they watch more films on the platforms as they become available. So this is obviously a, a motivated group that we, we want to um, encourage to see more films and more Canadian films. So uh, this is a bit of an overview of the, of the research we've done. We're going to continue to do similar type research, both to benchmark 
and then to drill down uh, maybe into more specific uh, profiles of cinephiles, the folks who go to festivals and so on to see what the, the story is there, maybe more specific on Canadian films as opposed to films in general. But I think the notion is to continue to do this kind of research. We have a lot of partners that, uh, that uh, are interested in uh, uh, getting together and working with us. And, and the notion is to build a sort of a, uh, uh, build the information, make it available to the industry, and then uh, help uh, you with the business decisions that you make. So, Charlie? Uh, thank you. Thank and you. I, I didn't watch the time, but that seemed like about 10 minutes to me, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> like um, it was stay? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I had a couple of questions about the study itself, but you answered some of them while you were talking, mm -hmm. so I, I'm going to have to cross them off my list. But I do have um, a, que a final question from the end. Uh, if I understand correctly, you've identified these consumer groups like the um, connected, the super viewers, the, uh, the casual viewers, but you don't know yet in those, within those groups who's seen Canadian films. Um, yeah, the survey that we did was focusing on uh, movie, like we thought the place to start would be movie going habits just in general. Right. And that what we're thinking is that, that uh, the, the, the next thing we might do is to drill down a little bit more and look at what the profile is of, uh, I would say, as opposed to viewers of Canadian film, but uh, viewers or, or of independent films, yep. uh, and where you know most Canadian films fit into that category, and to see what those habits are. Okay, um, so I guess the big takeaway from this, I suppose for everybody, is going to be that the trend is going away from uh, both cinemas and live television towards these new platforms. Um, and I'm just wondering how this is working out in practice, and I, I wanted to talk to Mark about that first. Um, what strategies are you using to get those films on new platforms and to drive audiences to those films on those platforms, Canadian well, films? You know, it's kind of ironic that the theatrical exposure piece is one of the greatest uh, predictors of success in those <coughs> ancillary platforms. We certainly have a few examples, and there's been a few particularly famous ones in the States of pictures that went straight to VOD and had a huge life, uh, you know, in just that platform. But really, for the one or two that follow that example, um, the vast majority of things that go to VOD immediately uh, have no, no success. Certain genres, for instance, absolutely can't get any traction. Family films, horror films, uh, uh, just fall flat when they don't have theatrical exposure. So one of the, the funny realities is that we, re we recognize is that theatrical creates a sense of, a, of, a move, uh, of, of awareness or, uh, in the market that's always the hardest thing to overcome. Like we don't, it's not so much about getting people to you know, want to see your movie, think it's a good movie, the hardest thing is getting them to know it exists at all, right? And in a world of VOD where we talk about it being an endless bucket, but let's just say a very, very deep bucket of stuff um, with, with curation being done mostly by an algorithm, it's really hard to expect consumers to be able to discover this content. When it goes through the theatrical cycle, there's a whole other um, life in those platforms that comes, that, that, that comes to the fore um, via that exposure. So I actually think the most traditional route is still one of the best routes. In the States, they're exploiting a model uh, now called Ultra VOD. This is the idea where you put it onto a VOD platform briefly, and then you go into theaters and try to build a theatrical and a regular windows after that. The idea being is when it's in theaters, people will have this sense like it's a big movie, but it doesn't actually have to be in your town. You can still access it while the awareness is there. In Canada, because of a, a restrictive um, uh, marketplace for theatrical exhibition, um, there's very little opportunity to uh, mirror that model. And it's quite ironic because many Canadian films are getting released in the States in that way and we're not able to do it in Canada. If, if you were able to, would you like to follow that model? Well, absolutely. Films? Not for every film. I still think, you know, a movie like Goon would go wide into every cinema and 200 screens across the country and we'd go in English and French. But I do think that for some smaller films that will never, ever, ever get theatrical exposure in smaller centers, the ability to exploit it theatrically in large markets and get some of the um, awareness that, of course, through the internet can, can permeate the country and still deliver some guy in, you know, Fort McMurray, uh, 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 that movie on a VOD platform on a timely basis would be a huge boon both to us and our business because I think we do more business with it. And I also think from a dissemination of culture point of view, uh, it really achieves the mandate, which is getting those films everywhere. Um, so I'm going to ask a question that, that's really for everybody. Um, and it came up in the course of talking to Dave at one of the interviews that Telephone put on just to talk about the, I guess, the future of marketing in the country to a certain extent, marketing strategies. Mm -hmm. If the best way of getting people's eyeballs on Canadian films on these new platforms is by releasing them theatrically first, 
is there not a bit of a fundamental contradiction? I mean, what I'm, one of the things I'm thinking is when you look at these new platforms, and there's a great article about Netflix in, the, in a recent New Yorker, there's a lot of talk of, about snacking and grazing as viewing habits. And I was speaking to Sandra Cunningham last night who mentioned that she also likes binging on certain things, on certain television series. And there are all sort of food references, right? And I kind of think going to the cinema is a bit like going to, to see a movie. In some ways, it's a little bit like you know, the family Sunday dinner from the 1950s. You have to go at a particular time. You've got to sit through the whole damn thing. You don't even want to get up to go to the bathroom because you'll disturb other people. Like You're really committed for that time period. But what people are doing at home is they're watching for a little while. They're going back and forth. They're going to the bathroom. They're going to the refrigerator. They're maybe referencing. If they're watching a series, they might be referencing back to the first episode, even though they're on almost the, It's much more like reading a book. It's much more, more a sort of a cold medium um, in the McLuhan-esque sort of sense of the term, in that you can examine it, pull it apart, play around with it. And a movie's very hot, like you are, you're stuck with it. And it had better be really engaging. And when, you're, when you have to see it on TV, you may not want to give it that level of engagement. And somebody once said something interesting to me, which is that TV's dialogue driven. If you walk out of the room, as long as the sound's on, you can probably follow the plot. But a lot of the best cinema, and I'm not just talking about big special effects or, or spectacle cinema, but also serious independent drama, there's a lot of visual cues. So if you're not actually watching, you might lose track of the plot. So how does that fit? How does finding a film, and I guess this is the question that, that Dave came up with, how do you know, and I put this to Paul first, how do you know when a film's theatrical? And if it really is theatrical, how does that fit with new platforms? <clears throat> well, you know, I like to use the story of the, the two miracles. You know, miracle one is you got the film made, <laughs> and miracle two is that people really like it. <laughs> and the other, to answer, so you kind of know whether you've got the second miracle or not. And if, uh, if you don't, then you just start talking about how good the cinematography is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, generally, that's, you know, if they're leading with it's really well shot, okay, it's not, probably not theatrical. But um, what I would say, we're in, a really, we're in a really interesting period because with the digital prints instead of the big cans, in terms of the cineplexes being able to run 20 screens on one computer, like, there are a lot more tools available. And we always have a problem with how much audience is there for our film. So, like, if it's a big spectacle, you have more audience. If it's a, an independent or a smaller film, then you have a smaller audience. So maybe you just need one or two screenings in that town. So that 11% that wants to go out to the theaters, they can come on the night that we do it. Like, I don't think... I don't think we have to stay with, you need 28 screenings a week in order to survive. Because the theatrical side is important. The theatrical side is important to draw you know, a lot of interest in it. So to answer your question, if you screen the film once on a Tuesday night in your town and 100 people come, that's a success. So, and it's still theatrical and gets it out. Ideally, you want to be sold out on your seven to nine show all week, but that's a different success. Theatrical. We test it and ask, you know, we, we put it in front of a test audience, uh, ask them where they want to see it and what they thought of it and try to get a good sense of it. No, I mean, the reality, of course, is I think when we all go to a movie, I don't think, I think probably everybody here in this room can look at a movie and answer the question, is that a theatrical movie or not? Is it a movie that you could see somebody who you know with 12 bucks in their pocket get shaken at loose for that? Um, they're not always the best quality films, necessarily. You know, they're going to be ones that will be, have a certain amount of star power that will be able to open it. They'll often have a defined genre that is very clear and easy for people to under, you know, understand what it is, the kind of movie that, that they're going to get. And there has to be a certain quality level within either whatever realm people are looking for. So if it's an action movie, it doesn't have to be critical level quality, but there has to be the, you know, the action up to a certain par. And, and in the case of auteur films, there have to be reviews and that kind of thing. And even having said all of that, there has to be a financial imperative within the nature of that film to make sense. In other words, if the film is going to require a million bucks of P&A and there's only 500,000 in box office and it's not CanCon, the economics aren't going to make sense of, of doing that kind of thing. Even with CanCon and telefilm support, there is a point at which you are really not maximizing on the amount of money being spent and you have to go to VOD. Um, so I think the theatrical determinant is uh, marketplace driven. And, in every instance. I think Mark's point about quality connects with your comment about uh, the difference between television and film, or, or what you qualified as a difference being that uh, 
in television, you hear all the things and you can go to the kitchen, as you say, and still follow what's going on. Whereas in film, what you called quality mark is a, an intent that communicates things in a different way. And as you said, if you go to the kitchen, you'll miss an important moment. So to give two examples off the top of my head, um, someone earlier today mentioned Le Dementement. There's so many things that happen on Gabrielle Arcan's face that you would miss if you went to the kitchen to get you know, your Coke or whatever. Or another example being Gordon Pinson's expressions uh, in The Grand Seduction. So I do think that, that there is a question of intent or quality in a theatrical film that is different from other modes. And obviously you've thought about this, David, talked to a lot of people. Do you have a... I have no idea. I, you no, know, it's one of those things where I think uh, it, you, you kind of you know it where you when you see it, and there is a, uh, a a notion of content that's made that you know when we talk about the cinema experience, what I would say the, the general category is, as opposed to a dichotomy between uh, at home and in the cinema. Maybe the way you you, you can think about it is uh, there is a public experience, so seeing film. So you know, for example, uh, this summer when uh, films are going to be screened on the lawn at Rideau Hall. That's not technically speaking a, uh, a cinema, but it's a public screening experience. And, and those of us uh, who uh, you know, stood by the, uh, we were 20 minutes in, so we can make a hockey reference. Uh, you know, people who watch the game together, it's a different experience. There's a reason why people come together to do things. And I think cinema is the same sort of thing. So there's an idea of a shared public experience that you have. That's not to say that you know, we, we hear the uh, discussion about, well, the quality of the, uh, the image and the presentation at home is very high. And I think what that's doing is, is uh, encouraging more folks to see films at home as well. And we're seeing that most of the viewing actually happens at home. But I think it's a false uh, premise to suggest that it's got to be one or the other. I think what we're hearing this morning, and I think that Mark made a good comment, that you know, there is a, uh, a way in which that the theatrical release gives credibility and validity to the, the sort of entire plan. And, and one of the things that, uh, you know, obviously distributors have always thought this way, but it's sort of a holistic view of, of how to maximize audience on all platforms. And that in the context of that, as opposed to thinking of the theatrical release as, well, will it be a moneymaker or not in and of itself, to think in terms of the theatrical release being a component in a larger plan, uh, the same way you think about festivals. You don't uh, submit your film to a festival in the hopes of winning a prize because it's a money-making operation. It's a way of raising the profile and notoriety of the film. And, and as Mark said, the biggest challenge is getting the recognition uh, and getting the awareness of the public in the first instance that the film is even there. So if you think uh, about uh, an entire strategy that's about the life cycle of the film uh, as it passes through all of its platforms, then the question you have for yourself is what, what do I do to create the, uh, as they say, the winning conditions for the film to move on? And that's where thinking of the theatrical release could be uh, uh, an important component of that, but I, th I thought uh, Mark's comment was right on when he said it's, well, I'm gonna paraphrase for him, it's, an, it's not one size fits all. There's an approach to, say, Goon, I think was the example you used, which works really well, but we're also seeing in other jurisdictions, and uh, possibly some of this will take, take hold here in Canada too, other approaches that present other options to create that awareness and interest and notoriety that can then carry through to other platforms to maximize audience wherever they may be, and that, uh, that also makes economic sense. So you don't blow your brains out spending a lot of money on something that you're never going to be able to get back, and that you know that's going to discourage you from doing that a second or third time. So I think that thinking more holistically about where the theatrical fits in for creating the profile for your film to carry it through, and that might be uh, one screening. And, you know, I got to tell you that that kind of thinking too, I think, is going to have to be the future for how we approach it. Finding ways to amortize this incredibly. Uh, expensive process of putting films into the theaters and of course as distributors we have to split that box office with with the exhibitor and we have all this front-loaded stuff with our ability to, to capture uh, those eyeballs later on and do some kind of transaction with them I recognize we've done sorry we've done a good job off in opening movies and it was actually Don Carmody said to us goes you guys are awesome at getting a movie open and you are shit at supporting it the second week right <laughs> And I took that to heart. And in this, year, in this year's budgets, we are going to put holdover dollars into the original plan because I now recognize that, that there's a resonance that comes off of that stuff that will, that will play out in the VOD window. And so we're actually in the process now of rejiggering budgets so that we are able to hold dollars that will spill into further weeks in theatrical and hopefully um, pay off in that VOD window. We'll see if it actually works. I can report back next year. Um, but it's, 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 it's speaking to the way that these new platforms are coming into, into being brought to bear. So that's a sort of a core, 
uh, not a quirk, but um, uh, something additional that you're doing with respect to this strategy of getting things out theatrically, which will then help the other platforms. What were some of the other strategies, though, that you were thinking of, Dave? And, and you said in other sectors there have been other strategies? Well, no, uh, Mark made uh, the allusion to some of the things that are going on in the States. I think it's, it's actually quite ironic that some of the things that are being tried uh, stateside with Canadian films are things that we don't seem to figure out, that we haven't figured out a way to do here. But that's because of the windowing uh, in Canada, correct? It's, it's, well, the windowing is one of them. And I, I don't think anyone is suggesting, uh, notwithstanding that audiences are looking for content, they're looking to have the content be available. And we see, for example, that uh, piracy diminishes, diminishes to the extent that content is available in a legitimate way at a reasonable kind of price. So the, all of that is going on. But the, ch the real challenge that we have is that uh, a lot of the films that we make are, are independent films that don't necessarily uh, support the kind of wide release that would get you everywhere. And I think that the notion is how to maximize availability on Windows that creates a winning situation. And by the way, because the theatrical uh, window is so important for some of the reasons we've already described and, and, and others, it's important to preserve the integrity of the theatrical window. So the idea here isn't to cannibalize theatrical to the point where it doesn't have that um, uh, that heft anymore to give uh, to give a sense of life to the film in its in its the rest of its career. So how do you preserve that integrity, make theatrical a special event, but also maximize other platforms, uh, whether in terms of timing or in terms of the efficiency of the marketing campaigns? And that. so that's really the challenge right now. Is is so it's an opportunity. And as much as uh, two, three, five years ago, it was pretty well defined. You had this many months to this, and so on. But now there seems to be a flux and there seems to be an opportunity. There's more players out there, more platforms. And the challenge is going to be how to, how to get the right mix. And it seems to me that that won't be the same mix every time out because we're talking different films here. Can I just raise a factor? And Charlotte, I'm sorry if you have a question and I'm jumping ahead. But in all of those slides that you showed, broadcast was a significant uh, factor in each of those slides. Sure. Uh, digital platforms are going up, but broadcast was significant in each of those things. And we aren't really getting any broadcast on pay or specialty or over the top of Canadian films in the country at the moment. That was actually a later question. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry but about that. Apparently 85% of Canadians are still watching their movies live, so the, the, my question was what can mainstream TV do to support Canadian films? Which all that I mean to say is that it's all well and fine to say that the digital habits and, and, and so on are increasing, but that broadcast and watching movies on television is still a way that people like to watch movies, and it's not really possible for Canadians to see Canadian films on television. And to the extent that they do, I think we've all had this experience, but Jennifer noticed it particularly, that there, a lot of feedback comes in, like you get a lot of calls at your production company when your films show on television. Well, I was telling Charlotte that through corporate machinations, a film that we made many years ago now plays on CTV, even though at the time it was licensed by City, and so it gets played on CTV regularly, and every time it does, even though the title is, is five years old, we never get as many emails or calls to the new real office as on the occasions of those broadcasts. I'm just saying. Well, what can we do about that? <laughs> Take over the world. <laughs> well, I mean, clearly the broadcast world has changed in their value of feature films. And the onus is on us to figure out how to help them with that. I mean, the past isn't coming back. But, you know, so there must be a way that they would need us. I mean, we need them. But well, I mean, you know, in a way it could be um, a less expensive alternative to creating a television series, for example. Um, what about um, grouping films together or branding them as Canadian or having a particular time slot for a Canadian film? My personal feeling is, and I think been said before, people don't make their movie-going choices on for patriotic reasons per se. They may very well enjoy a film like, say, *The Grand Seduction*, specifically because of it, the the you know yep. the way it highlights a particular part of our culture. But I don't think any of us would ever say, "Oh, let's tune into a Canadian film tonight, whatever it may be, uh, because it's somehow good for the country or good for our culture." Well, I mean, I really think an entertainment is. You know, the promise of entertainment is ultimately the, the, the main But separate arbiter. from patriotism, when is the last time that a film that you made was on a Canadian network? Uh, you mean current stuff sold yes. to regular broadcast? Never. No, never. I'm I mean, just saying. You know, 
I'm just saying. No, the reality is, is that most Canadians do uh, consume most movies on TV, and Canadian films are not available on uh, mainline broadcasts. Certainly, if you have a regular old basic cable package, you're probably never going to see a Canadian film. And if you do, you're going to see one that was licensed for unlimited plays again and again and again and again at, at a certain hour. Pay TV has... Um, been, is l continues to be the largest broadcast, you know, uh, 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 purchaser of broadcast, but their uh, the amount they brought uh, is quite is quite. Aren't uh, they buying less and less? They're, they're even buying from you. They're buying fewer and fewer, um, despite pledges to buy all Canadian films. Many many uh, Canadian films go unsold to the two main uh, pay TV services. Uh, even between the three services, many just will never ever see that platform, um, which of course is a crying shame because it does mean that these taxpayer funded films uh, are never going to be available. In that mass way to uh, uh, you know to national audiences, but or uh, to Canadian Cana consumers. Yeah, but a lot of Canadians do have Netflix subscriptions. Um, so do we want to talk about the OTTs a bit? Um, I notice on Netflix there does seem to be a Canadian section. How are we feeling about that? Is it helpful One of those or are particularly current? Isn't that true? Netflix is uh, becoming a uh, good volume buyer of content. There's no doubt about it. They're buying Canadian films along with other stuff. Um, they have no obligation per se to do so, and I think the Canadian section right now is not the most robust, you know, part of that service. Yeah, I identified several films that weren't Canadian in the Canadian That's section. That's what they found. It's not <laughs> Canadian section. You know, awesome. so if I was if I was an OTT looking to avoid regulation, maybe I would be trying to sort of wave the flag a little bit. Um, you know, the current selection would suggest that that's perhaps not enough to ensure that we're getting a full representation. I mean, everybody in this room knows more about this than I do, but can the OTTs be regulated? Is that possible? Sure, why not? Do they fall under the CRTC? Every TV that every everybody's got a kid in this room when they buy when they go to buy their first TV in life, it will have a plug-in thing that connects the internet right into their TV. I think the the idea that there's a big difference between the broadcast world and the OTT world and somehow belies the fact that those things are quickly converging and will soon be completely converged. Uh, we regulate tons and tons of stuff on the internet, uh, uh, like commerce and other things. I, I, I think the argument that somehow it's a ungovernable space within our national borders is ridiculous. Um, so would this, how, how does this group feel about, for example, Netflix being a little more regulated, having to provide more Canadian content, and have, or having to promote Canadian content? Well, it's the question, uh, generally, do we think that uh, you know, uh, there's this notion of downstream platforms, right? That you have the, you, you know, you open your film, whether it's through a series of festivals or then uh, perhaps you're opening in theaters across the country, or you have some type of profile that you've built theatrically. And I think that the challenge is, uh, you know, if, from perspective of, of uh, an over-the-air broadcaster, uh, when you're looking at three to four years down the road, that it, the, the kind of discussion you have to have is, well, what would be the uh, the return on my effort and investment? If, obviously, there's a notion that, well, I'm going to promote something when it's going to be on the air for me, and if something's not going to be on the air for me for a long time, it's it's less I'm less inclined to be uh, participating in that. But I think that what we have presented now, and I'm not reinventing up here on a panel the notion of the orderly marketplace, but I think there is some opportunities right now for some experimentations around, uh, you know, uh, that 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 uh, that. What we're, what we're finding with Netflix and other things is there's a lot of exclusivity. We pay premium for having exclusivity for Windows and that for the amount of money I'm paying for my license, I get to have this for a period of time and I'm the only one who has it. And so I, th I think that that kind of um, approach, we'll see where that goes over time, but I think generally speaking, what audiences are looking for is content to be more widely available. And so then the question becomes, uh, to what extent, uh, are, uh, when we talk about promoting, for example, when you say Netflix should do more to promote, or any other, or iTunes, or anybody else for that matter, uh, you know, at what point would their promotion be the most effective? Uh, is it at the time that it appears on their on their uh, on their service or on their platform, or would it be to help with the initial promotion of the film to create that profile in the first instance? And so, if you, uh, you know, I think that obviously broadcasters have a role to play, and I think that the comment was made earlier that. It's not just that the theatrical is a proxy for the life, but theatrical also is a, uh, uh, a déclencheur. It, it is a trigger for uh, awareness 
and success, and it's no surprise that often the most successful films theatrically are also the most successful films on every other platform where they, where they make a stop, whether it be DVD and broadcast and so on. So then, then the notion is how to, uh, to create a sort of a winning scenario where broadcasters are motivated enough to have the film available on a timely basis, whether they program it as, as a, uh, a series of Canadian films or in a slot, I mean, that's, that's all uh, to, to, you know, to be discussed, but the idea would be to, to sort of say what role could uh, other, say, downstream platforms play in having films available on a more timely basis? Can we open up some of the exclusivity and in exchange for that promote and, and then work in collaboration to determine where is the promotion the most effective for creating the brand that will ultimately the goal is more viewers when the time comes for you to show it on your on your service. Well, Whether when the broadcasters are involved, it helps create the awareness right off the top. Even if their window is later, they send out their teams, or they used to, to do uh, B-roll and so on, and that important uh, awareness building no longer happens, and that helped Mark, mm -hmm. and now he doesn't have that help anymore. Mm -hmm. And again, in a world where like I said earlier, we're really, it's all about creating awareness more than even the want to see piece, just letting them know that it's out there. That's a huge piece. I mean, the, when, the, the, when we buy the space on TV, there's an immediate change, of course, to the awareness levels that, you know, they get in a, in a way that no other level of promotion able to do. But of course, Canadian films have a limited budget and there's a limited amount of money to spend. If we, have, and may I also point out that most Hollywood films have a long pre-awareness cycle, right? You see the trailer for Christmas in the summer, right? Not two weeks before it comes. It's the first time you see a Frozen trailer. It's not two weeks before Frozen opens, but it's while you're still seeing the summer cartoon that was, you know, thing uh, for a film that's coming out in November. One of the things that, that I couldn't agree more with that statement because one of the things that broadcasters can do for us is help close that gap a little bit uh, between the existing promotional opportunities that exist for wide release Hollywood films and the challenge that all independent films have in the market by building a pre-awareness base so that by the time it actually starts to get close to release, you at least have some people who have heard about it a little bit. I mean, we try really hard with the wide release Canadian films, but it's extraordinarily hard with narrow release films. There's no place in cinemas for the trailers. There's no way to get that kind of thing going. And then to Dave's point, once you, if you're able to get it going, it resonates in all those ancillary platforms. Um, well, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, are there not other strategies? I just got a note from one of my friends in Europe saying that uh, films that had uh, gotten involved with fundraising campaign, uh, crowd funding campaigns, were actually getting a lot of attention from festivals way in advance, and the festivals were actually, depending on how the crowd funding was working, <coughs> were earmarking those films for festival invitations once they were made. Has that been a, have either of you done any of that? Has that been a useful strategy in terms of raising awareness way in advance? I mean, there's this Ted Hope idea that you should, as a producer, should be building your audience from the minute you think of making a movie. How's that yeah. working out? It's not something I've been involved in, the, the whole crowdsourcing thing. I actually find it really weird. Maybe I'm just, you know, a dinosaur. Who knows? Have you, have you tried, <coughs> excuse me, other stuff uh, in terms of? We've tried crowdfunding, um, although I'm not supposed to say that if CRA is in the room, but um, <laughs> we tried crowdfunding <laughs> on our previous film, which was by Bruce LeBruce, who's a very well-recognized brand internationally. And despite the fact that he is so well known internationally, uh, the venture wasn't very successful. And this is someone who is a brand. So I'm not a believer. Um, did it make people more engaged, though, in the film? Is this Gerontophilia? Yeah. Do you think that you got some fans as a result of trying to raise the funds? I mean, forget whether you raised the I, funds or I not. I think the crowdsourcing is also a risk because I know of a, a colleague of mine went out expecting to do well, and on the surface, you would think. And then it was humiliating. Mm -hmm. So you get like the, you get this whole like non-performance can hurt and you, also you also. Have to and if you actually are successful, you have to give people things yeah, that you sorry. may not be able to. <laughs> I think you just Although some, of, you know, the, one of the problems, of course, is some of the campaigns have been too successful, and people got way more money than they actually even wanted, and well, that's, had that'd to be fulfill. Well, a happy problem to have. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, well, yes, but you know, if it means you have to suddenly send out three thousand t-shirts when you thought you were going to have yeah. to send out twenty. It, yeah. Can okay, I just yeah. change the topic back to something that Mark just said before you were asking about this, and that is that with respect to the broadcaster participation, it's not only on the platforms that it's significant. When Monsieur Lazare won the Genie, the first entity he thanked was uh, SRC, and when uh, films win Oscars, almost the first entity thank is, is either HBO or Studio Canal. Like, in every instance of the film's life, 
the participation with the broadcaster is something that creates a, a public moment, and we do not have that in English Canada. Well, certainly when, when things are commissioned by broadcasters, absolutely. And in the UK, that's been very successful in terms of awareness. Yeah, they got some skin in the game all of a sudden, yep. and a good reason to do it. And I, you know, Jen, I think that's an absolutely uh, uh, on point comment because Thank you. at the end of the day. This is a massive size audience that's out there night after night on television, and the fact that Canadian films don't get that, you know, even just a little bit of special time there where they can get their word out to sort of balance the playing field and be noticed a little bit is a crying shame. Um, <coughs> we apparently have 10 minutes left, and the idea was to get some questions from the audience, so we can't comments? see you, though. I uh, know they're gonna turn the lights, they're gonna Sorry. shift the lights around so we can see them. So do we have any thoughts out there? Hi there. Do we have a mic? Hi. It's Jack Bloom again. Hi. Real Canada. I just want to, this is a great discussion, I just want to turn it on its head a little bit. Starting with Dave, your study, and the idea that going to a Canadian film or choosing a film because it's Canadian is, is uh, not a driver, and obviously that's true. Um, I just wonder about the fact that we're all so wild about the Olympics. Every couple of years, Canadians get to uh, celebrate being Canadian together, collectively, while we watch our fantastic Olymp uh, uh, athletes perform. I can tell you, we serve about, at the moment, 40,000 uh, young people, students, and new Canadians across the country. And I can tell you there's an incredible appetite to have an opportunity to celebrate being Canadian together. We demonstrate it every day. Canadians don't get that opportunity. And so I want to challenge you to speak to the idea that there's an opportunity for the film industry. It wouldn't happen right away. But there may come a day if everybody in the room devoted 5 or 10% of their resources, or 3% of their resources, to building collectively a sense among Canadians that watching Canadian film and Canadian cultural products in general was a way to celebrate their incredible love of the country. It's a market that's open and it's an appetite that's there. And I think the opportunity exists to take advantage of it. Yes, I'm a bit of a crackpot, I admit it. <laughs> but, but I see this response every single day. Yeah. They watch and, and the films, we, they love the films. We okay. see it, I, I don't know if the comparison to the Olympics is really fair, but we do see it with Canada Reads, for example. Canada we, Reads, they create a dialogue. I'll, I'll let you speak, but yeah. they create a dialogue you're, and, and it think, creates some excitement. I, I think you're essentially, uh, you're essentially correct, uh, Jack. I mean, I think that we'll just be careful here. When we're talking about being a driver, uh, the, the, the quiz is very sort of the specific question we asked, which was what comes into your mind? What's part of your thinking process? You've decided you're going to go see a film or pick a film on TV or go to a cinema. What's part of your process for picking it? And in that context, it is not front and center that a film is Canadian or Australian or American that, that's driving. That's different from saying what you're talking about, which I completely agree with, is the sense of pride. And so what's important is that we recognize that positioning films as Canadian is not going to uh, necessarily have more people choose to see the films because what they're interested in is what kind of film is it, what's the story, and so on. But connecting the dots after, and I think there's a real sense of pride. We saw that uh, in uh, the recognition that people have when, whether it's an Oscar nomination or a film that's been very successful, or, or it's important to make the connection for folks when the film that they've seen is Canadian. And what uh, a good example of that are, I guess, the screenings that, that uh, Telefilm and its partners do here in Ottawa. Um, uh, along with the, uh, with the department. Uh, over time, what it's done is created a critical mass of awareness among members and, and uh, among, the, uh, among the members that there is a high quality films that are being made and that are well worth seeing. And that it's not because they're Canadian, they're just good films and they're seeing them. So I think we just have to be careful that connecting the, with the sense of pride and the sense of achievement is really important, but that uh, just what, in terms of the narrow scope of the research, that it's not something that if we, we to suggest to Mark that in this next campaign that uh, it be uh, really focused on that component, that's not what audiences are looking for when they're making their decision making. So we're just distinguishing the two things. So it, I am kind of agreeing with you when saying just in that context, that's not what's driving people's, that's not part of their decision process when they're picking the film to see. Uh, 
Hi, my, my name is Jane Tattersall, and I noticed that not a single person mentioned the Starlight Channel application last year. Now, I do understand that was going to be considered a must-carry, so it had controversy that was associated with the broadcasters as opposed to with the concept of Canadian films. But I'd be very interested if any of you are interested in making some observation about that and how it relates to the discussion today. Um. She did stay away from it um, a, a little bit. We, we discussed it in advance, and we just felt it wouldn't be productive to go there. But does anybody want to comment? I'm all for having more Canadian films on TV. Yeah. Yeah. I think Jane, we all feel that way. Okay then. <laughs> um, I was thinking a little bit about because we have a tiny bit of time. I was thinking a little bit about what you just said and. While I agree that what people are saying is we really care about genre, I, I, I had some questions about that part of the study. I, I, I think people care about whether it's a comedy or not, but I think it's more complicated. Like, don't they care about whether it's a big comedy or a small comedy? You know, I'm not sure that a, a delicate little comedy from Prince Edward Island is necessarily going to get the same, you know, thumbs up as a huge American studio comedy that's got a, a ton of advanced press. So. I think, it, I think those questions are a bit more complicated than they might appear to be, and I think the issue of people not caring about whether the film's Canadian or not, they might not now, but if, if there was some awareness building, and, and there has been awareness, but further awareness building in a really positive way, that might actually change the study. You know, it's, it, it might. I mean, when, I mean but, there's a, there's you know, a sort there's of issue of leading people here as well. Sure, right? but you know, don't forget, though, uh, the, the other questions that came up were things like, do you... Do you, do you, is your impression that the quality of films are improving? And this was about Canadian films. Uh -huh. And that on that score, that generally speaking, in both language markets, uh, in the French market, uh, where their perception is already quite high that the films are high quality, that the perception was they're improving, and, and it was equally so. So this is, I don't think that we should read into this that this is not an issue for Canadians, or it is not, uh, on, uh, they're not mindful of this, or that there's not a perception that the films are quality. That the, there is a perception that the films are quality, and there's another one that's, that, on top of that, the films are improving. So I think that's front and center, and I think uh, you're exactly right, Charlotte, that I'm not uh, an expert on surveys, but yes, when we look at this, broadly speaking, comedy is the most popular genre according to 2,000 Canadians that we surveyed. Let's be careful that, you know, this is not, for example, a mandate for telefilm to say, next year, nothing but comedies. I mean, well, the, like, all those... Well, this crossed my mind. I was actually going to ask, all, you should just all be making comedies. Like, uh, all producers should only make comedies make, in Canada. As long as they're funny. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, well, I think that, that there is that. Right. No, what I think what it speaks to is the notion of a balanced portfolio that that includes different genres and different different types of movies and different scopes, including the ones that you, you described. I think that it's it's a little too simplistic to say, well, comedies are the most popular, so uh, therefore uh, let's. You know, it's interesting when we first presented. Uh, the, the results of the survey, one of the folks around the table was Michael Kennedy from Cineplex, and he had actually some good comments to make on the notion of comedy. Well, comedy might be good, but comedy is hard to sell internationally because it's often more local in flavor and so on, and so that sometimes makes it, what makes it uh, more valuable for us in Canada in terms of our own sensibility is what might make it difficult to travel internationally. So there's a, like, a, as I say. Oh, oh, by the way, a lot of comedy travels really well internationally. Well, uh, well let's make more comedies then. Uh, <laughs> So I think that it's, we have to avoid being too simplistic. The notion was just to get a, a sense in the overall of what sorts of things on that particular question, what sorts of things are, are people thinking about when they're making a choice to see a movie? And once again, it's not counterintuitive to think that genre, uh, if we were to ask uh, even the people in this room, I, I bet you a lot of folks would say cast, sorry, genre, are probably right up there near the top in terms of of what's factoring. So not, not to read too much into it, but that's just generally speaking. But once again, that was the notion of doing the study is get a first take from, from people and then a year later go back or two years later go back and see where we've gone uh, and have those things changed. Have impressions about the quality of films. Have impressions about the accessibility of films. Have there been changes or trends in terms of where people are going to find their films, uh, where they're going. There was a whole section too on where, uh, I won't, we're probably running out of time, but we as an example, actually. The older you are, the more likely you are to read reviews and be guided by that. The younger you are, you're, the more likely you are to use social media. I doubt that surprised anyone uh, to hear me say that. But those are the kind of things that we're seeing. And I think what's important is to make that available to everyone so that you know, it can help inform your decisions.
uh, I'm being told that we've finished, we've run out of time, so thank you very much all of you, and thank you, audience. <laughs>